Welcome back uh, to our next section. It's going to be about lecture tools, uh, which is a Echo 360 uh, product that we have at ATSU. It's open to all programs, all classes can use it. Um, uh, we originally got the program. We it's sort of a we thought of it originally as a kind of a replacement for some of the polling software we were using and, and that's kind of where we originally thought of it but it does a whole lot more than that and uh, the, we're going to have uh, Bob Siebert here from uh, Echo 360 is going to talk a little bit about lecture tools and then in a little while we're going to bring in um, Neil Chamberlain from KCOM who uses it in this classroom today and he's going to talk a little bit about from the instructor side. Sounds good. Great. Uh, Thanks for having me down here. I live in Denver, so it's not really cold right now compared to Missouri and Iowa right now, but it's sure nice to be in Phoenix or Mesa or get the right community here. Uh, I'm a uh, solutions engineer for Echo 360, and uh, going to a little bit, mainly demo, I'm going to use just a couple of slides to kind of set up what I'm doing so you don't get totally lost in what we're talking about here. Uh, Lecture Tools is a, uh, a company that Echo acquired. It started at University of Michigan and uh, really came about from, um, let's see if I, why didn't my slides advance? Just click right in the middle. Re okay, got a different computer and a different thing that I'm used to here. Okay, there's my slide arrow. Okay, there we go. Um, this is a, a look at a classroom at the University of Michigan that Perry Sampson teaches in. Uh, and uh, no, it's not an ad for Apple, but it does look that way. Um, and, uh, but what he found is this is what he's starting to walk into. And not uncommon from a lot of times when I teach here. We got a lady on the back on her uh, smartphone. We got a gentleman with his uh, laptop open. We got a little pads over there. I'm really encouraged that there's actually a piece of paper and a pen here in the front row. But she does have a smartphone sitting right next to it. So. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, this is not uncommon most of the time unless you ban technology. Has anybody ever tried to ban technology from a classroom? Doesn't work, right? But I have to have my phone, I have to have this and everything else. And uh, so, what we found is uh, in a lot of studies, and these have been done na nationwide, these are some just right at Michigan, 45% decrease in attentiveness. Boom. People are doing multitasking. All the studies, the best and brightest, and you've got them here. They can't multitask. They can simultaneously single task, but they're missing out on things when they're doing that. Um, decrease in engagement. Uh, people are not paying attention. But the biggest problem we find is decrease in learning. The time that people are spending in the class is not being utilized in actually learning. So a couple things that can happen on this, and what Perry found, uh, Perry Sampson, who really kind of built this, um, is technology can offer an opportunity to be more inventive and more active in your teaching, okay? <coughs> Students are coming to class with all this technology. They're used to using all of this technology. It's just becoming more pervasive in everything they do. How come it's not pervasive in the classroom? Um, you know, you can really start to use things for specific pedagogical approaches. Uh, and it does take a little bit of change in how you want to present and how you want to teach. We're sitting here with this wonderful technology, this 3D printer going on out there, and, the, and everybody's looking at it like, wow. You know, and you go, okay, that, that's opening up a whole new world. And it's going to change how some things happen in medicine, uh, probably even in teaching and some of the things. Um, but the biggest thing we find at the bottom is students that are participating in class, they really want to be part of the class. Uh, we find, and I, I, I may, you may kick me if I say this, with a lecture capture that's going on right now, students can just not come to class. You know? Most of the time we find there is not a decrease in student attendance because of lecture capture, but we know it's out there. I have, I gotta tell a story on my son, he just graduated from University of Colorado School of Medicine. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and he's quoted, uh, the dean up there is just retired. My wife graduated from med school in the year the dean was in his first year. My son graduated in the dean's last year, longest tenured dean of any medical school in the history of the US, uh, to span that gap. <laughs> uh, talking about the difference in technology, and I have him on tape saying, well, we have lecture capture, so if there's good powder and veil on Tuesday, I can just skip the lecture and play it back on Friday. And I'm going, <laughs> don't say that. But the truth of the matter is that does give students a capability to do that. 
So if you want them in class, you have to engage them during that time you have them in class. And that's really what we're looking at here. So um, what we come up with, and, and this is, this is kind of overblown of, of the slide we're going to show you. Basically what we want to do as a teacher is very easily upload our PowerPoint keynote type presentation. If you're teaching off a set of slides that sort of is a roadmap for your class, what we want to do is make those available for a student. And we want to be able to allow students to interact with that so they're using that device as a positive way in class. But then we want to be able to interject into that activity slides. So even in a class this big, if I was teaching in every, every, the front row, people actually got here late and had to sit in the front row, and I'm teaching this class, and I got a point and I ask, are there any questions? Are we totally convinced as instructors that everybody that has a question is willing to actually raise their hand? <laughs> no. There's somebody that will sit back there and go, I have no clue what this guy's talking about, but I'm not going to be the one to raise my hand and say I'm dumb. You know, because that's what you feel like, okay? So we're gonna look at a way we can engage these students. So um, the nice thing about this, it, it, if you've used clickers or heard of clickers, those are engagement tools. So I say, I'm gonna put up an ABC type question, which is very common. If you're gonna take the boards part one, it's all ABC type answers. But um, you told me what you taught when we were standing outside. You're teaching? I teach anatomy. Anat anatomy is a great one, you're in? micro things are very graphic it's not a b c's and d's okay this is a picture of winds uh around the earth but you think of this as anatomy that was my knee instead of the winds on the earth and i'm going to go i want you to point to where the lateral meniscus is and how do you do that in an abc question so if I have students at this point in my presentation that said, okay, I've been teaching, I have my plastic model up here I made on my computer, I have one that shows a bad uh, uh, torn lateral meniscus out there, and I'm, I know that because I have a bad one. Uh, don't push me for much more anatomy. Uh, I can lecture and talk about that. I can put a picture up there, and I'm going to ask students visually to answer a question for me. And students then can go out in a diagram and, and put a dot on where I'm talking about. That's going to give me as an instructor a whole lot of information back of whether they're really in the right idea. So I, when I put that up there and get an answer, I'm going to see this nice cluster diagram, hopefully right around the right answer. If I get this big scatter diagram all over the place, I, I got information back from the students, but the information back from the students is we're not on the same page of where we're at right now. So. Let's take a look at, uh, I think this is basically, uh, oh, by the way, I wanted to bring up the idea. Um, works on tablets, uh, smartphones, laptops. So really pretty much a wide range of technology you have out there because people will bring a variety of different things to a class. After winter break, there's a whole new level of technology that people brought back to class. So uh, it's very important to be able to use this in a lot of ways. Um, yes? after iOS devices, uh, yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, let me. Ooh, I'm up here. I'm teaching off of the. Uh, your classroom computer, so I don't have all my shortcuts and, and log ons here. So uh, bear with me just for a moment. Biggest thing is I have to remember what my passwords are now. Oh, good. <laughs> If I keep them simple enough, they aren't all cached on my computer. Um, so what we want to do again is make it very simple for our students. Students are very adaptive technology. So what we really want to do a lot is be able to go out here and uh, uh, very easy to go in through Blackboard. Uh, we can have a link. I'm going to link in through um, what we call our Echo Center, if you're familiar with our capture side of our product. Um, but uh, we can use that um, as a stepping stone to get to the lecture tools side of it. Um, so if I go in and view my course tools as a student, what this is going to allow me to do is come into an interface that I'm going to have 
a list of courses out here. So example, this is way back to fall 2013, I, I did a demo course for Arizona State. Here's one for Stanford School of Medicine. I uh, was tied up this morning and didn't rename it. it should say AT still out there, my apologies. Uh, but what it allows a student to do is click on that current class that's being taught. And what that's going to allow that student to do very quickly is they can download a basically a copy of the slide presentation. So as you go out there, they can go out there and have in their uh, possession on their desktop the slides that you're using in class. So I don't know about you, but when my teachers were teaching, they're flipping through the slides and I'm taking notes and I'm trying to, and I look up and the slide's gone. Wait, I wasn't done looking at that. Or I'm two or three slides down in the presentation and all of a sudden, aha, now I understand what you meant three slides back. So this gives that student that capability to go, okay, this is the interior view of the heart and I want to go back and say, okay, I really want to go back, get out of the activity slides, and go back to this slide that was put up here, arterial stenosis, and go back to, now I want to understand what went on there. So my pace of learning, I can control some of the information that's being presented to me. So if I didn't catch it at one point, I can go back and look at those slides. I can get that learning moment back. Um, but what really becomes in play very nicely is now on this slide, I can go over here and contextually to this slide, actually take notes that are going to be attached to that slide. So when I take my notes, they're electronically uh, contextually attached to that slide. So when I take a note over here, it's going to stay on slide 8. And in addition to that, I can go out here and draw my own. My mouse is off. This is a really interesting mouse. I'm trying to circle up here. It, 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 that's, the, that's the mouse and not me down here. I think we've got a wireless mouse. <laughs> it's a little off where my screen is. Um, and so I can go ahead and put some graphic notes out here. Um, I can star these, bookmark these slides so they're important slides. Or more important, I can flag this slide as confusing. I can send a note back to the instructor that says, I've looked at this a dozen times and I still have no clue what you're talking about. So I can flag a slide that says it's too complex, it's confusing. It gives information back to that instructor uh, of what's going on out there. Um, and once these, uh, uh, slides are all put together, I, uh, these notes can all put together, I can then uh, of course just print them out as I would my, my study notes. So I would have a copy of your slides over here, my notes along there, so if I want to print these out or save them in a format as a study guide, I can do that very easily and, and follow along with that information. Yeah? Does this software provide a method to capture notes and slides digitally? If the student doesn't want to print, but wants to record the slide and the notes that they kept during the session. Uh, yeah, we can just save that out here. Uh, it'll save it as a file for you. Okay. Yeah, so very easy if you want to just uh, print that out, save that as a file. Yeah, so you put it yeah, electronically, uh, absolutely. So, you know, this is going to give, if, if all you did is uploaded your PowerPoint presentation, keynote type presentation, and allowed the students to follow along and ask notes, um, very powerful. They also have this capability to ask a question. Um, so again, if you're going 100 miles an hour and never stop and ever ask questions, you come in. I've heard this at medical schools. You walk in in a long white coat, come in, teach, stand at the podium, stage on the stage, walk out the door, and never even look around to see if there's any questions. You know, classic. Uh, still gives capability for students to ask questions. And this may end up being, as you see when I open this, I see other questions that are asked. This gives students a peer-to-peer -peer capability to say, I'm reaching out for help. And it may be another student that's going to answer this question for me as much as an uh, uh, instructor. Yeah. Are, are the questions anonymous? The questions from a student standpoint are anonymous. This is where I plant the questions under the seats back there. From an instructor, we know who they are. So you're logged in here, and so you can type, you know, a good question, or if you decide to attack the professor, we can tell you exactly who logged in and, uh, yeah, take corrective actions.
One, one more question. Uh, would you be able to ask a question per slide, or, or would you have to tell them, like, oh, on this slide, I had this question? Uh, what that's going to do is uh, it's going to link you back to that slide when you put that in there. And uh, yeah, so it's going to keep track of, because of, when you ask a slide, you, you're going to have a chance to uh, attach that to back together. Yeah. Okay. Um, so those are nice tools, but really what we wanted to talk about more today is the capability of going in here and then starting to add uh, the, uh, let's see. Uh, I haven't used this presentation. I've been, I've been on an extended two and a half week vacation at the end of December, so uh, yeah, if, uh, if somebody's messed up my, uh, my slide presentation is it? I had some really good questions in here. What do they do with? Them? <laughs> um, oh, there it is. Okay, I knew I had one of these in here. This is your classic. As a matter of fact, I stole it directly off a review course for cardiology boards. This is a classic boards uh, type question in a medical environment. Okay, gives the setup. A 65-year-old male presents. You know, classic ABC type answer out there to the the question. Uh, something you might want to present in a class. Uh, the follow-up question to this that was uh, presented um, in the, um, um, yeah, here it is. The follow-up question was also an A, B, C, D in the boards because you can only type them on a computer. But in a classroom, I changed this to the follow-up question, what is the role of a balloon phalloplast in this patient? Instead of giving A, B, C choices, I'm now asking my students to type in a, in a short answer response here. People are really good at 140 characters or less, and it's not difficult for students to type in an answer. So from a student, from an instructor standpoint, I've asked an open-ended question to my students, and I want 25, 30, 100, 200 responses back, and that's going to give me very quickly an idea that they're using the right terms and, and nomenclature that I'm, I'm talking in. You can put these answers up, they'll show up on the screen when you answer the question, but all of a sudden you're asking, it's really easy to say A, B, C, or D. You go, I'm not paying much attention, I'm going to pick the C. Sounds like a good answer. And you took part in the class and, you know, teacher, who knows. But when I'm going to ask you to put answers up there, you're going to have to stop and think a little bit. Go, oh, wait a second, <laughs> you know. Uh, and that's what you want. You want to be able to, and that's where we're talking actively. I want to take that class of, what's your big med school, 150? Uh, 170. 170, it's up to 170? Good. Uh, you want to take that whole 170 students at that moment and grab all of their attention, get them all off of Facebook, all off of trying to scalp tickets for the Super Bowl, whatever they're doing out there, <laughs> and focus immediately on the question you have. But the neat thing about this is, okay, all of a sudden I woke up and the guy's nudging me next to me because he's saying, hey, by the way, the instructor knows if you participated in this and got the right answer with our analytics. So you go, okay, I remember there was a slide back here that really had that answer on it. So as a student, I could go back and say, oh, I remember this slide back here one rep we used to work with says, so oh, don't throw that slide. I said, oh, that's a good slide. <laughs> that's a fairly good heart valve out there. I said, it gives me as a student now a learning moment. I was asked a question in class. I'm squirming in my seat because I really don't know the answer to it. The instructor is going to be able to tell if I actually responded and got the answer right. Learning. I go back in the presentation. I go through a few slides that's up there. And I go back to this one. And instead of saying, I can't type here. I have no idea. Uh, I still can try. I can now type in the correct answer, or whatever that is, and submit that now to the instructor. So once it's submitted, you can see that um, I still have a capability to change that answer. Yeah. Now you had this set up as a text to a cell phone. I can do that also, yeah. I mean, but where is the instructor? Would I get this and how? Okay, I'll show you the instructor. I'll, yeah, I'll show you the instructor side of it in a moment. Yeah, okay. Uh, you, you just set up for text for your cell phone. You can go back to a very simple old, uh, you know, uh, just a key non-smart cell phone and text in an answer. Uh, when this was originally built, 
people still had those. Uh, and I don't see a lot of them anymore. But uh, uh, so if you don't want to, if you don't want to follow along with a smartphone or have another device, you could just text the an answer in. Yeah. Um, so right now, I, I still, as an instructor, I still have this poll open. So it says I can change my answer. On the instructor side, we'll show you in a minute. I can go ahead and close this poll, which says I'm going to lock your answer in, and I can display the results. Now, what we like to look at is, I'm not going to tell you what the right answer is. I'm not going to tell you what the right justification is. I'm going to look at what the answers came in on these two questions, the A, the A B, C, D, and the follow-up. I'm going to look at that information as an instructor and evaluate whether I'm on the right pace for teaching and learning. Because if I get a lot of the right answers and a lot of good justifications, I go, yeah, this is the smartest class I've ever seen. They're right on what I'm teaching. If I get a lot of stuff back that says students are not understanding, what we really want that to be is a moment of, aha, I need to go back and kind of reteach this concept. Because I'm not getting all the answers I like. I'm not going to tell them what the right answer is. That's not teaching them anything. That's teaching them what the right answer is. I'm going to go back. I'm going to close this uh, poll, reteach it, reopen this, and then ask them again, let's reevaluate that. Now, what, what do you think the right answer is? And then if I see a big shift, obviously, to the correct answer, I know it's safe to continue teaching. If I don't, then I really got to go back and find plan C or D, uh, because now I really have a disconnect on what's going on out there in the class. Uh, so some very powerful capabilities. Let's see if I can log myself off here and get myself logged in as my instructor side. It's going to be easier if I go back. If I don't get myself hung up on my cable here. Uh, yeah. Let me go back through Blackboard. It'll be easier. I uh, log out here. Apologies for this little bit. I, it's easier to do it this way than uh, try to get my laptop on the uh, secure network here. So if I go back and look at this same um, environment, and this should bring me into the instructor viewpoint. So if I go back to the same class, if I can click it here. So now I'm on it from an instructor standpoint. And what we're going to see is when I want to go down to this activity slide that we have up here, if I get in percent mode. So uh, at this point, what I have is the capability to go out and So here's the, here's the question as, as an instructor is looking at it. And you'll see that down here at the bottom is really my kind of control panel for what I want to do as an instructor. So uh, I have two students registered in this class, one of which was myself on the other side. So it shows one of two students has answered that question. First of all, why am I teaching to only two students? And second of all, I only have a 50% presentation. 170 students, if I see 165, 150, whatever good number, I know people have responded. 100 probably is pretty good. Um, so I know people are taking part. So I can go ahead and uh, close this polling. So if I want to finish this and show what the results are, it's going to show uh, where the answers came in and um, finish the polling. Uh, the results are out there. And so I can go out there and look uh, and see what, what answers were given to me. Um, and the results are hidden. So uh, uh, I can have an answer in this if I wish, if I want to put in a correct answer uh, that I can show to students or, or uh, use that as a uh, basically a grading and assessment side. Uh, but the big thing, like I said on this, is I can go out there and reset this poll. And if I go out there and reset that, 
And if I, if I had two browsers open right now, which I normally would, go jump back to the student side, where I put that answer in before, my answer's gone, and it's gonna look like that poll never happened. So I can go in as an instructor, look at these answers, see what's happening, valid, validate them as correct or incorrect, or very easily reset that. The other thing I can do, obviously, at that point is just close the polling altogether, which is going to lock in those answers. So if I, I can use these, like I said, to put out a uh, assessment if they correct or incorrect. We don't see that a lot at the graduate school level. It's huge down in like community colleges and some schools. It's really easy to get polls and make this attendance and activity part of a uh, uh, kind of an activity grade. Um, so that locks the answer in. So even if I did tell you the answer in class, I still couldn't go back and change it. So once it's closed. So um, very easy for instructors to do that. Uh, like I said, they have capabilities over here to look at the dashboard. There's an unanswered question out there. They can go out very easily and uh, answer those questions uh, either before or after class, have a TA work on them, those type of things. So really gives you some good interactive in class, uh, ways to get their attention back at points throughout your presentation, plus the ways to, um, the anatomy professor that uses this up at um, Michigan, and I'm going to misquote her because it's not exactly what she says. I have the video somewhere. It's something that I say, I now know what my students don't know. And if you've seen that tape, and that's really kind of interesting as an instructor, is to look in your minds of your students, and they got a lot of people out there with their heads kind of nodding, yeah, yeah, I understand. And all of a sudden you ask a tough question, and you go, they don't quite grasp this. They got enough, but they don't have the whole thing. So if I can get them to give me the answers back, point to items on the uh, uh, graph of that type of nature, I could start to figure out what's going on out there and really ad address my instruction to meet those. Um, pretty much, I want to cut over to your instructor that uh, sure. is using this. Uh, first of all, before I cut off, any questions? I have a question going online about oh. captioning. Uh, the use of captioning, is there any way to put a transcript or anything in this? Not at the present time. I'm about to say, we're doing, uh, we're actually coming up, we'll talk out here this afternoon, kind of a follow-on product. Uh, and there are some things that we're working on in that line. Yeah, but I won't get into that with this group. Okay. You figure out how to make the other guy yep. jump live here. I'll probably bring you back here for questions okay. towards the end. Uh, I'm always interested in the users have to say so yeah. Ooh, I need the screen share still. Ryan? No, he just needs to uh, uh, un, un, un yep. there you go now. Put it on the top. Hello everybody, can you hear me? Yeah, um, just to let you know, uh, I've been using Lecture Tools since uh, July 2014 with my classes. Um, and the uh, reason I went to using Lecture Tools was because uh, I wanted to continue to engage my students and assess their learning while I was in the classroom with them. Uh, every five to ten minutes I'll ask uh, interactive slides or in the past reviews turning point and uh, uh, the, the, there were some advantages to that but there were some also some disadvantages to using turning point um, and uh, when I found out about Lecture Tools uh, I said well this would be something that I'd want to jump on to continue to engage students and help them learn in my class. So um, the thing that happens with technology is starting from scratch all over again. Uh, constantly we're, here's the new technology, now you gotta start all over. Um, and so what I wanted was some kind of tool that <clears throat> all my lectures are in, in PowerPoint and I wanted something that would be, that I wouldn't have to recreate my presentation all over again. And, as it turned out with lecture tools, I can go from my PowerPoints, uh, upload those PowerPoint slides, and uh, have them available. Now, uh, it doesn't upload every PowerPoint plot slide if there's animations and various things, those don't upload, but the static slides that I had work quite nicely to uh, upload to, to lecture tools. And then what I could do is to continue to have those interactive slides, the ABC types or open response type questions uh, for the students and uh, could then demonstrate to them in class 
um, what the answers were from the group, and then sort of what I tend to do is say, here's what I was hoping that you all would say, and uh, here's why I feel these others might not be the answers I was looking for. Um, and with that idea of uh, modeling before the students how to rule in, rule out uh, things with regard to medical microbiology and infectious disease. Um, so the nice thing about lecture tools was is that it allowed me to um, still use the PowerPoint slides that I had, many of those. Um, I had to redo the interactive slides, but uh, using the lecture tools, but I didn't have a huge, it wasn't a huge amount of work to do. Um, and there were several things that as I've been working with it that I kind of like uh, about the, the instrument. One is, is that uh, uh, I am cheapskate and I like free and it was free to us. Um, the other thing is it allows me to create these interactive slides um, and we have all of our KSOM students are on uh, iPads in class and with the previous tool that we used for interactive slides it was a little bit uh, difficult because you would bounce between the the software to look at the slides to the PowerPoint or notability and it was not integrated quite as well um, and sometimes there'd be problems with that so, uh, however with this it's all integrated quite nicely together if they're in the lecture tools app they're looking at the interactive slides and they're responding using the app they don't have to bounce between uh, looking in notability uh, or another app in order to look at the uh, PowerPoint slides um, and the interactive slides. So the other neat thing was is they can use laptops, cell phones, uh, iPads. We never seem to have trouble with that. Um, the other thing I liked was the, um, it was, uh, there's some other capabilities with some of these interactive slides that we didn't have in, in Turning Point. Uh, the idea of having an image where students could click on that image to tell you whether they've identified a certain uh, structure or not, that, that was very valuable. Um, one thing I was worried about, since this is an internet connection, uh, uh, internet driven device, it was just, how, you know, I've got like, sometimes I'll have a presentation that's 90 slides long, but it's 90 slides long because I'm going to be talking to students over two or three lectures. And so if I upload this, this is going to take me all day to upload. And I found the uploads were really quick um, and it didn't take very long to upload those slides and then to get to work. Um, no special software or hardware was needed. Um, and as long as I had my uh, presentations in Power PowerPoint, I could upload those pretty nicely. Um, the nice thing was, too, is I had some students as I was uh, giving the lectures and the lecture tools, um, they would flag some slides that didn't make sense to them. For instance, one student flag, flagged one of the interactive slides. She says, I don't understand what this is. And I was able to respond back, well, this is a, a slide I'm using to question you to see if you understand this prior thing. And they go, oh, oh, yeah, I understand. When I come to class, then I'll be able to figure this out. And so, so uh, that helped work things out and, and students could ask questions. Now I typically don't look at the questions while they're in class. I tend to look at them after uh, lecture. Students haven't grasped uh, the power of lecture tools very well yet at, at uh, KSUM, um, but there are a few that have asked me some questions and I've been able to clarify those questions with them using lecture tools and I thought that was a really good thing. Um, the other thing is I can tell who was at class and who uh, logged on to lecture tools and followed um, and I so I can and, and who they are so that if I wanted to give them some valuable feedback then I could give that directly to that student uh, in order to help them um, there's uh, some things that you know there's always things that you don't quite like about it as far as a lecture and one of those is, is that uh, and it's always I'm an old-timer okay so whenever the electricity goes out can you still lecture um, and of course uh, you can but uh, it's really hard since PowerPoint's no longer there and those sorts of things if the internet goes out this is an internet based tool and so it's, it's, if the podium it the access to the internet is unpredictable then this does make this tool a little bit difficult for the lecture however my experience at KCUM and, and also when I've been out to Arizona is our connections to the internet are much better than they were when 19 or 2000 when we were first starting this. Um, the other thing is, is there, I tend to like to change things a lot as far as templates and the interactive slides have one template and I haven't found a way to change the templates to change the look of the slides. And so you tend to get the same 
and look, um, which is just a personal preference for me. Uh, the third thing is being a microbiologist, we use a lot of scientific names. And so I like to always have my, my, my organisms, especially the bacteria, and there's genus, genus and species and italics. And unfortunately, I haven't found a way to make the interactive slides uh, put in the italics yet. Um, there probably is a way, I just haven't found it. Um, the last thing I think that was sort of a challenge and one thing to let people know about is there are some lectures that like to put a lot of these, a lot of animations in their PowerPoint to, to have things move in and move out. And, and uh, we have one microbiologist or immunologist here on campus that does a great job of making these animations to show how an ELISA works uh, for enzyme linked immunoabsorbent assays. And she'll have the antibody come in and then the antigen and, and these things swooping in. When you upload to lecture tools, you lose those animations. And so uh, what you'll need to do is find some way to uh, either utilize PowerPoint to do those kinds of slides or find a way to set up and make a GIF uh, movie that you could then upload and connect to the lecture tools. So that's one thing to just uh, remember is those things get lost when you bring your PowerPoints up to the lecture tools instrument. Um, the other thing is, is that I found is I tend to have give a lecture on respiratory diseases and I like to have an audio file on whooping cough and I oftentimes have a, a movie that I get from YouTube on whooping cough and I had that sort of integrated in with my PowerPoint slide and the thing is is when you upload you lose those links to those movies um, or, audio or audio files and so what you need to do is uh, you make a multimedia slide using lecture tools to link to YouTube movie or to your audio file and then upload your audio file. Um, and so those are just some things I learned my trial and error um, that uh, hopefully if you tend to use the tool, we'll, um, you, you, you'll know ahead of time that you'll need to work on adding a slide in that, that respect. Um, overall, I thought the experience was good. Um, my problem was is engaging my students since they're using several different apps on their iPads to use lecture tools and so my goal for this year is to try to get them more involved with lecture tools uh, as far as an app rather than notability and those sorts of things to try to get that, that questioning and the flagging of the slides uh, better uh, as far as them interacting with me in, in my lectures and so uh, my trial this year is to try to work on that to increasing their awareness of, of how this tool can help them interact with with me as a lecturer so and as a faculty member so that's my take on lecture tools and the, the response I got from the students was that very few problems most of them were using their iPads or laptops and they had very little trouble uh, connecting and getting the thing to work so that's all I had if there are any questions all right thanks Neil um, I have you mute your microphone here and we'll I have another question from uh, for Bob here, the, had somebody asked about how to get started in lecture tools and where to go and how to set up an account. And let me back to the screen share. Here. So actually getting started. Um, The answer, oops, I just lost the microphone, so you can't hear the answer. Um, the answer is if you just go to mylecturetools.com, um, I believe, I, I remember how we're set up an account here, uh, but um, I'll have to get one of my account people actually to verify it. But the, the base account is mylecturetools.com, and I typed it right, uh, and I didn't. <laughs> Forgot the tools. Um, be careful if you mistype something on the internet, what's going to come up? <laughs> there you go. Um, and uh, when you log in just as an instructor to set up an account, uh, and, uh, I'm already logged on here, which is why it, it, it jumped me in on the uh, I'll log on. Uh, if you want to just create up an account, sign up for an account here uh, based on uh, the emails, I think it's going to automatically set your account up. It's so. Not connected to our LMAP system, and it doesn't use your ATSU password. It's a separate password at this point. Yeah, okay. So just set, sign up for an account, and uh, 
uh, use your uh, yeah your uh, AT Still EDU account uh, and it'll get you started on it. There's also some great tutorials out here uh, once you get started that will work you through and give you some help information out there. So uh, yeah, it's, it's really pretty quick to set set up and get going. Could you describe briefly how students connect to your presentation? Uh, a student is going to go in and what we want to do for a student is very similar to how I came in through my institution. There's an LTI link hopefully on the Blackboard system. So uh, what we would like a student to do is go ahead and log in, get authenticated through Blackboard. So they're going to be using a university credentials and authentication. So again, like when the questions came up, I'm not logged on on my uh, Facebook account or my Google Mail or you know where they're you know some of those email addresses are pretty uh, interesting. <clears throat> Remind all of your students when they start interviewing in fourth year and stuff that when you send out emails, try to make it look like a professional email address, even though it's at gmail.com. <clears throat> but uh, uh, so a student can set up, so they'll see their courses here, and when they uh, click the course that they're in, uh, we'll add a link over here that will take them directly into the lecture tools. So it can just say lecture tools there. Uh, I have these linked right now through the Echo Center, but what they will do is not see this come up. They would go right to the lecture tools here. It would be a seamless single log on they would then see the list of their courses so all they have to do this would normally be the same course with the different dates you're at so uh, they would just click on the course they're interested in uh, the dates that are out here for that that lecture they're working on and go uh, right into uh, their learning environment that answer your question yes thank you. good we try to keep it simple <laughs> um, so is the Lecture Tools app available for non-Apple? Currently there's only one out there for the iOS devices okay. and uh, mainly for the iPad. So okay. uh, we're working on ones. Uh, it, it's really working uh, very nicely on uh, browsers in other tablets. Okay. Yeah, it's just uh, it, what you're going to get is the, the browser image that we look at instead of a tablet environment. Okay. Yeah. In Blackboard under course tools, I'm not seeing anything at all for Echo 360 or Learn Lecture Tools. Maybe we'll just slide in here. Yeah. <laughs> how we actually get to it to put it in the Blackboard? Okay. Uh, that may be just how they had the course tools. So, uh, um, yeah. yeah. Well, <clears throat> course tools, there's nothing there. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> um, the way we have been doing it uh, is under any content uh, area, there's a, 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 a tools here. Mm -hmm. There is there a Echo 360 and a lecture oh, tools. Okay. Uh -huh. content. Yeah. yeah, I think there is a, a tool in for it. I had to rest about it where it's hidden that. We do have the LTI. LTI but, uh, uh, when you click on that, and if it's the first time in, in your course that you're doing this in, it'll ask you if you want to create a new lecture tools course or whether you want to attach your existing one. So if you made one last year and you want to hit the same one again, you can do that, or you can create an all new one. And if you create a new one, it will title it. And it will it'll create it in lecture tools, not in Blackboard. It'll title it the same as your Blackboard course. Mm -hmm. So it'll say 14, 15, uh, spring, and whatever your course number is. So the lecture tool course will be titled that way, and it will keep some continuity for the student. Um, also, when you go, when you set up through lecture, when you set it up through Blackboard, your students go through, they don't have to log in, you don't have to upload. A, a CSV of names of, of people to enroll. Um, it just it makes it so much easier if you start through Blackboard and, and create your course that way. There is a way to do it the other way where you, you log in through the LTI, through uh, lecturetools.com, and you can upload stuff there, not through Blackboard. And you can set up your courses that way, but then you have to up, you have to import CSV of students and, and, and enroll people <coughs> manually. And it's a pain to do it. <coughs> Yes. So I sent Eric Summer is all podcast based. Mm -hmm. So 
Uh, you know, it, it does because a student can follow along anywhere out there with this. So, uh, you know, the application, uh, I could put a course together uh, that has a series of PowerPoints and embed those uh, activity slides. And if it's a remote learning kind of a flipped environment, I can leave that open for a week, I can leave it open for a day, I can leave it open for a semester and then go in at a certain time frame and look at those responses so I can still use this in a, in a remote environment. Uh, and the students still have that note-taking capability and they still have that question capability. And like I said, the activities are still valid. It's just you don't have that kind of interaction in the classroom where if you get back a strange result, you, you can't really do anything about it. But uh, we see this a lot in what we call the flipped classroom where we want to do a presentation and we can bury some of these poles in our flipped classroom and uh, it gives an instructor a very good idea whether the student actually watched the presentation and you've had to answer a few questions. Um, it really helps and we see that a lot being utilized. So is there any way to audio on Not at the present time, no. You'd have to work that in conjunction with doing it part of the, the um, uh, lecture capture portion at the same time. Yeah. Any other questions uh, for Bob here or for Neil Chamberlain and, and who's still with us here uh, no. from Missouri? Still here. <laughs> I, I had a question. Okay. Can, can you, uh, what kind of files can you upload? Uh, right now they're PowerPoint files. Yeah. And uh, we're working on ways, he mentioned the uh, uh, build slides and activity slides. We're working on follow-on versions to put uh, presentation rib uh, ribbons right into PowerPoint and how we can start to use some of those uh, animation and build capabilities that are out there. So we're looking at ways to eventually be able to present directly from a PowerPoint, which gives people a, a capability as they, as they modify their PowerPoints, not have to go that upload process again. Yeah. Question for Neil. Can you hear me, Neil? Yes, I can. Yeah. How, what's been the response from your students? How did they like it, and, and what has been their reaction? Well, I haven't gotten any negative responses. The students, uh, I had one student that had trouble logging in once, um, but uh, they seemed to find it uh, useful. Um, they quickly got onto the interactive slides, and I got answers from them pretty quickly. Um, and the transition to it, I thought was pretty easy. And actually, I think they liked it a little bit better because with the old system, they had to switch between uh, notability, looking at their slides, to the app for uh, the turning point slides um, to then interact. And they didn't have to do that any longer. I think that was uh, had an advantage. Did that help? Yeah, thanks, Neil. Does turning point work with it? No, it's basically Ford and Chevy's, yeah, <laughs> or Lexus so and Rambler or something. <laughs> clickers, I mean, I think Ryan probably, uh, someone has those, or who has the clickers? Someone has them. Yeah. Okay. I think there's some on campus that yeah. they use physical clickers and hand them out. Right. He doesn't interface with this, though. It's still a different PowerPoint. Okay, so clickers work with this because it's PowerPoint. No, sorry. No. It doesn't no. work with this. Work, you'd have to have a, you'd be running a PowerPoint instead of this. To use the turning point for the cover point because it's no longer a cover point. That's his image is basically now. Mm -hmm. I have a question for Neil also. Can you hear me, Neil? Yes, I can. Are you Good using the question here. function at all so that they can dynamically during your lecture ask questions? Because I tried using Twitter one time and there was so much stuff going on and I could not convince them I just need to see your questions. <laughs> I, I haven't uh, responded to them dynamically. Um, I do have, what it does is that you can look to see if they're asking questions while you're giving, your, while you're discussing things with them in the classroom. But for me, I, um, I, I get too distracted looking at that and then I lose my next point and then we don't, we're not on task. And I think I disturb K-Stone students more by not being uh, within the schedule uh, 
then, uh, so what I do is I tend to take the questions, I'll look at those after my lecture's over, I'll come back to my office and I'll click up and I'll see what questions they've typed and then I'll make responses that way. Uh, so I haven't done it uh, dynamically within the class, but you can. That help? Yeah, that's perfect. Can I ask Bob a follow-up question then? Can sure. I turn it off? Can you turn the I, questions I've got students up? students in class yeah. that spend the whole time trying to answer other students' classes and not list our questions. Not at students. the present time. We've had that request of turning off questioning, but not at the present time. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what I found with the questioning, just to clarify, though, is, is that you can bring that uh, sub menu up on the screen to see if they're asking questions, but you can hide that so that you're not being you're not. distracted by the constant questioning. And, and answering and that sort of thing. So, so the, the lecture tool has that capability to, you can bring up your desktop and see what people are asking, you can put it back down so you can continue on with the next topic or concept. We've seen in several large undergraduate classes where there's teaching assistants that have like a TA type monitoring logged in on the same one. And a lot of times they can answer some questions in class, but also if they see a preponderance of people asking the same question, the TA can go, on behalf of the class, I would like to ask a question. And, uh, you know, that, that works sort of like Dean was doing here with, we have a question from a calling user, you know, uh, uh, occasionally if it's something that's really important and can't wait to after class, but a lot of them are what we currently see as like office hour questions where somebody would come in and talk to a professor and go, I'm still lost, I need some help. And like uh, you mentioned, answering those after uh, class, and especially knowing who that student is, if you see a consistent level of questions that is showing, we see two types. We see the, the student that is well above the class material, really interested in that in their career field, and they want more information. You can deal with that student, or you see some remedial type questions coming in. Same as people coming into your office hour type environment. You can reach out, and a lot of times, I don't know if you found this, a lot of times you aren't really answering their questions. You're reaching out to them and going, why are you asking that question? You know, why don't, you, why don't we start a dialogue here of understanding why that question was even asked and understand where you are in my class. And if, if that opens up that relationship between a student and an instructor, then you've really embraced that, that learning and took what could be an at-risk student or the next Nobel scientist and really met their needs. <clears throat> time online okay. for questions oh, yeah, okay and if not we're at the top of the hour how about that we said we go to one o'clock and you know I think I've done this before <laughs> no, no more questions we're clean. Uh, yeah, appreciate it thanks Bob thanks Neil um, thank you great talk thanks